teachers, my name is Taffy and I'm with the Alliance Theatre Institute here in Atlanta, Georgia. And today I'm going to be showing you some theatre games, some tips, some tricks and activities that you can do with your students for your digital learning, your digital storytelling. But I'm actually calling it interactive digital story teaching because rather than just sit and tell a story to your students and have them listen, you're actually going to be actively participating and engaging with them during the digital media. And the way that I like to do this is my favorite two theater games are statues and pantomime. And the wonderful thing about this is A, kids love doing them. They love being a statue. They love doing pantomime. The other thing that I like about them is, as you know, as educators, when we move the bodies, the minds engage more. So we're finding a way to take them from just staring at a screen to actually moving, engaging with the content so that your students get more out of what's happening. And I also like them because once you use these techniques, get used to using them, they're fantastic in your classroom. As fun as they are digitally, they're absolutely wonderful in your classroom. When I do residencies for the Alliance Theater Institute, I've done a number all around the school for kindergarten, first grade, second grade, third grade, fourth grade. I always like to start my piece with some type of movement, some type of series of uh, moving the body and the voice because I think that it's a great way of getting kids to focus and to sort of transition into what they're doing. It also gives them a spatial awareness of what's going around and their parameters to their fellow classmate. Um, none of these uh, movements have to be exact. You can change them the way you like. If you do yoga, you may think, wow, those kind of remind me of sun salutations. Well, that's because they're based on sun salutations. And I always like to think, regardless of what the movement is you want your students to do, think of all the directions. Send them up, send them down, move them forward, move them sideways, just in a flowing manner. Nothing difficult, nothing hard. If you have students that have physical challenges or maybe you're in wheelchairs, you can do a series that's just the waist, just the arms. Modify it to your students. You know your kids best. You know what they need best. So the ser series that I go through always starts with what we call neutral. And it's wonderful for your kids to learn. It's as simple as this. You're standing with your feet slightly apart, your hands are down, your head's forward. And once your students learn neutral, they become absolutely obsessed with being able to do it. I, I don't know why. So I'll have them do neutral and I'll say, okay, everybody wiggle, wiggle, neutral. And as soon as they hear that word, they should go to neutral. And I'll, oh, pretty good, pretty good. Let's try that again. Wiggle, 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 neutral. Wow, that was really great. And your kids, they're so proud of themselves. They're like, we stood still. And you can actually get your entire class of 27 first graders to stand still and look at you and be happy about it. So we'll do that a number of times and all of my motions start with neutral. And then we move into the movement part. As I said, I like to always incorporate all the different directions. So I start them in neutral and then we just stretch all the way up. Then I'll have them sort of dive forward like they're gonna dive into a swimming pool, sort of hang down. Place their knees on their hands, put their heads up and look forward so as you can see, the legs are straight, the back is straight. Then I'll have them just go down without falling over, balancing on their feet just to touch the ground. And then I let them wiggle and move however they want till they're stretched all the way back up and bring the arms down to the side. If you're limited with space, you can have them bring the arms in front as well. Either works. So I will go through that series again in case you didn't quite catch it. it Stretches all the way up first. You dive forward, bending at the waist, just sort of hanging down. Hands on the knees, looking up, going all the way down to touch the floor. Wiggle your way back up and arms come down to the side. And I would go through this series two or three times with the students and really encourage them to do it all together. And once they're back in neutral, I'd say, let's do it a little faster or slower, uh, engaging them, getting their minds, and they're completely focused on this activity. It's also nice if you've got those, oh, those days when we have indoor recess and they can't get outside and they're just going crazy. A little break like this here and there between lessons can really help sort of get those wiggles out, get them refocused for the task. After I've done through the movement, I like to add some sound, and the kids love adding sound. 
using the voice, getting expressive. And we will use this movement, this awareness of body, this awareness of voice, in the activities that we do for the digital story teaching. So it's not just a time filler, uh, it's actually a great platform to scaffold on for the work that's going to be coming. So we add a little and the splash and everyone's personal favorite, oh my back and then flop and then whatever sound they'd like. And that is the sequence. I'll do it one more time because I know you enjoyed it so much. Splash. Oh my back. Flop. And once I go through that routine, I might have them do it faster, louder, really encourage them to do it. By the time I've gone to a class, probably about three times, and generally my residencies are for 45 minutes with one class eight or 10 times. By about the third time I'm there, they know it, they have it down. They know how to go into neutral, they know how to do the routine, and I step away as the leader and say, okay, you take it over, you do it. And the kids will all do it as a group together, an ensemble moment. We always end with what I call three breaths. In neutral, telling them to breathe deep into their bellies like a balloon, and it's just exactly what it sounds like. Breathe, three breaths, breathing in. And these should be silent breaths, breathing in. And the last one I breathe in, I push the air out, I wiggle my fingers at them, and my arms come down. Three breaths is actually something that was taught to me by my mentor, Ron Anderson, of the Springer Opera House, so I don't want to take credit for that one. All right, moving on to what I listed before, statues and pantomime. Statues, very simple. You're creating a statue of an object, a place, a person. This is not about the acting, any of this. You're not trying to create actors. You're not trying to think, oh my gosh, I, I'm not a good actor. I can't pantomime, I can't do this. It has nothing to do with being great at the art form. It's using the art form to connect to both sides of the brain, to inspire creativity, and get the students up and moving and integrating with the material. Don't worry what it looks like. That's not the point. Whenever I teach statues, I tell the students I have two rules. One both feet on the ground. I tell them I don't want any statues falling over and breaking and getting hurt, or I tell them if a statue is only on one foot, I'll assume that this statue is not working and I will have to set it to the side, which with first graders is great because you can actually physically pick them up and set them to the side. Also, my second rule is no laying on the floor. Why do they love laying on the floor? I, I don't get this. They love laying on the floor. I don't want them on the floor. Face, feet, never a good mix. So I would ask the students to start in neutral, and if, for example, you ask them to do a statue of a bear, most of the kids will do something like this, right? And you'll get some that'll be amazing, they'll be like, ah, they all wanna be fierce. You might have to remind them, ah, remember, statues don't make sound, statues don't move. And you'll also have a few that are like, and it doesn't look anything like a bear. Don't worry. For students like that, I would go up and I would ask them to explain and say, wow, I said, what's What's your bear doing? What, what, what's your bear going on? And they might say, oh, my bear just got into a hive and is covered in honey and is stuck and can't move. Okay, that works, you know. Or more likely, they'll just look at you with that cute little smile they do and So you break it down into your components. Well, what, what do a bear's hands look like? Do they have fingers like us? No, do they have, okay, paws. How would they hold their paws? And just sort of reset their statue piece by piece until they've done one thing altered one thing that looks more bear-like. And then you're like, that's great, that's fantastic, and have them go back into neutral. Some popular topics are baseball player, zombies, dinosaurs, superheroes, any of those they love doing. So we do two or three different characters to get them used to the motion. And that is statues. Pantomime is slightly different in that, again, they are creating scenes, but they're doing it silently without having uh, any, any sort of vocalization, which is what silently is, uh, and, and working it all together. Pantomime is wonderful for uh, exploring certain science concepts. You can really start to have fun with how things move, how they interact. And for pantomime, there's really only two or three key tips. One is take it slow. 
everybody wants to do everything fast and it doesn't look like pantomime it looks like they're being attacked by a swarm of bees and that's what i call it swarm of bees i'm like oh this this is what is this this is a swarm of bees everybody swat those bees away so when you're doing pantomime you just do it slow watch your hands because your hands are what helps you realize the spatial relation that you should be doing and once you start watching your hands you you're aware of what you need to do picking up a glass is the easiest one you visualize the glass, pretend to pick it up, take a sip, put it back down and release. And it's, again, this wonderful, you're taking this uh, concept and putting it in their brains and they're having you re-visualize it in this three-dimensional way using their bodies. It's pretty advanced thinking. And a lot of them will make their glasses, you know, the size of a straw and they'll put their mouths up to their faces and your hands up to their mouths. And so we break it down. We go, how big is a glass? What would your hand be like around that glass? You can do a whole, <laughs> you can do a whole great uh, uh, lesson on just pantomiming solid objects and the values of a solid object, the weight of it, the shape of it, and super duper fun. Um, so glass, things like that. Um, and that's, that's pantomime. It's pretty, pretty basic. So applying those to a story. I have two stories today. Um, well, I have two types of stories today. One, they're all from Scholastic. We love Scholastic. And I'm not quite sure what the uh, protocol is in your school or what sort of um, agreements that you personally have with Scholastic. I'm assuming that for your digital learning as a teacher in the school, this will not be a problem. And as I'm not reading the book today, I don't feel like I'm creating a problem, but you will want to check and make sure that if you're recording a book that you are not getting into any copyright infringement. Although I don't think teachers should ever be considered copyright infringing anything because the job you do is amazing and wonderful. So I've got click clack moo, how's the type? Books that lend themselves to digital story teaching interactively have a lot of characters, a lot of action, physical action, or have different components that we can really break down. I've also got a few texts also from Scholastic uh, dealing with animals and different physical elements of the world. We'll get into that. So I have done a digital storytelling uh, piece with this book. I know the Alliance is going to have it posted online so you can use it with your classes. And I chose this book because, I, first of all, I love Doreen Cronin, and I love Betsy Lou, and I think their work is amazing. And approach digital story teaching just like you would if your students were sitting in front of you, right? Tell them, look at the book by Doreen Cronin, pictures by Betsy Lou. Hmm, somebody who draws, who does the pictures, what are they called? You're right, an illustrator, right? And, and so what does the other person do, an author? Ask them to look for clues of the characters, just like you would teach. So you're setting them up for success. And then I looked through the book and I looked for moments in the book, and I'm gonna come a little closer, moments in the book that would be great for either making a statue out of or doing some sort of pantomime too. And one thing I noticed right away for interaction is that there's a repeating phrase in this book. Click, clack, moo, click, clack, moo, over and over and over. So I thought, how easy. Um, letting the students know that every time I say click clack, they should say moo. So already you've got your kids at home, just think how cute they are sitting at their little table saying moo to you on the screen. I love this. Um, so the click clack moo, already we're interacting them. So at different parts of the book, they're going to be re-engaging with you because they're verbalizing. And then I saw this wonderful picture of Farmer Brown and that's going to be our first face. I'm going to say, Wow, everybody make a face like Farmer Brown. Ooh, boy, those are some, how would, what are some adjectives, some describing words for Farmer Brown's face? Grumpy, that's right, frustrated, that's a really good word. So exactly like you would do in your class. And I went through, there's another click clack, moo. And every couple of pages, I looked for a moment where I could re-engage the students doing something physically or vocally. I've got the cows looking here, and I would say, okay, everybody, make a cow face, right? Um, we've got the typewriter. I would say, everybody, pretend to type, pretend to type. So using your motions, using your, uh, your statues, your pantomime, going through the book, again, with the chickens and their wonderful expressions. Um, how can I run a farm with no eggs? And here you've got a great opportunity for a statue with Farmer Brown running away. 
So you can just stand up, stand up, and make that, make that picture of Farmer Brown running away. Oh my goodness, my goodness, and now make a statue of the cows. Oh, those cows, look at those silly cheeky cows. Have them sit back down. Um, moving on through the book, I got to this part and I loved this because you've got some words that your kids are gonna have no idea what they are. Neutral party, and I love that it refers back to neutral, meaning getting ready, getting prepared, and ultimatum. Uh, so going outside of the text, even in your interactive digital story teaching, don't be afraid to, to go outside the text and say, ultimatum, that is a big word. Can you guys say ultimatum? What do you think that might mean? Anybody? Does you know what that means? So you can be talking about that outside the context of the book. Uh, all the different characters here. You, this is an opportunity where you could have them create the different characters. What character is this? A horse. Can you show me a statue of a horse? Can you show me a statue of a pig? Statue of kitty. What do you think kitty's feeling? So going back and forth between moving and non-moving moments. Talking about the resolution of the conflict and the compromise and how they made the compromise. Um, going through the rest of the book until we get, and then of course the surprise at the end when it's click clack and they say quack instead. So now they'll all be laughing at home, la 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 la, at the end. And then if you're dealing with your kindergartners or your first graders, you could even go back and do a retelling a story with beginning, middle, and end. Hit another standard here and say, okay, remember back the Farmer Brown got a note that said this animal was cold in the barn. Can you guys make a statue of which animal was cold in the barn? Great. Next, another animal was cold. What's the next animal? Oh, look at those cute little hens. Can you add a sound to our hen? What would our hen sound like? And who was the neutral party that delivered the ultimatum? Can you walk like that character? So now you're going to have them pantomiming, wiggling all around. So that is how I would approach a fiction text. And I would take a very similar approach dealing with a nonfiction text. And I picked a few things out of these. I've got one here dealing with animals of the seas. And one page I particularly liked was this page on camouflage. You've got these photos of the, uh, the flatfish, which is a wobble gong shark. Honestly, that's so fat, a wobble gong. That right away, just, wow, wobble gong. Uh, laying down, you could say, can you camouflage yourself? Everybody lay down on the ground. Let's lay down. All right, everybody lay down. Let's pretend we're getting a fish. Oh, oh, oh. And you know they'll be doing it at home. So remembering, adding that action, that pantomime to their learning. And as they continue to talk about the camouflaging of their environment, I thought, how fun to have your students say, look around the room right now. What do you see in the room? Do you see chairs? Do you see couches? What kind of furniture could you camouflage yourself as right now? On the count of three, we're going to think about what we want to camouflage ourselves as and do it. And they might make a chair. You could look around your own environment. I would say, well, I'm in a room right now that has a bed, uh, has a lamp, so I'm going to be a lamp. Click, click, turning on and off. So creating the camouflage as they're talking about it. I, I thought that was so much fun. And as it happens on the next page, there was another wonderful moment of interaction when you were dealing with this coral reef and going into that standard of animals and their environments and habitats and all these little fish and there was this great picture of this eel hiding and i thought how cool would it be if you were to become the eel and all of your students at home were to become the fish and you could even if you want do the old let me see if i can get one here the old, the old sock i thought how fun if you became the eel and had your students at home become the fish in their habitat, swimming in front of their screen and made like a little cave and said, okay, swim around, fish, go, oh, gotcha. Oh, I've got you, Amari. I'm mm -mm, thirsty. Oh, oh, I got you, Nick. And you became the eel in its habitat, getting the fish that were swimming around. So fantastic interaction on both parts, rather than just reading a story and answering questions. I also have one on our world, space, another, I know another one, atmosphere, our planet, and you've got um, 
this wonderful view of the earth, take them on a journey, a pantomime journey of, oh, we're going to go into space now. We, do we wear these clothes in space? No, we wear a space suit. Let's put on our space pants. Everybody put them on. Put on our space jacket. Put on our space helmet. Put on our space gloves. Look at yourself in the mirror. Say, I look good. Mm -hmm. Yes, you do. And then let's go up. What do we see? What do you see? You see the moon, of course. The moon. What else do we see? And taking them on a journey, wearing these wonderful things, having them pantomime walking, talking about gravity. What is gravity? So if we walk on Earth with gravity, it's heavy, but on the moon, we bounce. Using that motion at home to connect with what's going on in the text. Uh, and even for weather, when you're dealing with the components of weather in the seasons, all these beautiful snowflake shapes. Could you become a snowflake? You could ask your students to create a snowflake of themselves. Use your body to create a snowflake. Let me see, let me see your snowflake drift and move. So any of the elements that you have, think about visualizing them and turning them into something you can use with your body. And by asking your students to do that, you're really engaging some fantastic STEM higher level reasoning and thinking because they're having to take, again, this flat image, this piece of knowledge, and turn it into a three-dimensional living thing that they recreate with their bodies. It makes it a lot more fun for them and it's a lot more fun for you. And when you get back to your classroom, there's no telling what all you can do with it. So thank you so much for tuning in today. I am Taffy with the Alliance Theater Institute and I wish you Good days and happy teaching. Bye-bye.